the story and things that don't make sense. Now that all that's been said, I could finally talk about the story, which isn't as important of a topic as you might have thought. So yeah, this story is basically like Star Trek Nemesis, a big, powerful evil ship, Romulans, and revenge. But in this movie it was alright, in Nemesis it wasn't. Here's why. By the time we got to the Next Generation films, we already know the TNG crew. These movies were desperately begging for a slow-moving, well-written plot. Instead, we had dumb villains and doomsday devices and a 65-year-old man trying to be Bruce Willis. In Star Trek, so much time is needed to establish the characters and how they all get into place, you don't have time to have a super complex villain and story. I mean, I guess you could have pulled it off. Maybe. But why take the risk and fuck up the first film right out of the gate? Ah, uh, but let's discuss the plot anyway. So the movie starts out with Kirk's mother giving birth to him. Again, the super dramatic opening hooks people in. Is it cheap and easy? Yes. Does it work? Yes. So why was a nine-month pregnant civilian on a starship? I don't know. Maybe they were on a long, deep space assignment she was actually a fellow officer who got knocked up during the mission. Point is, she picked a pretty bad time to go into labor. Why can't women do anything right? Okay, so some star somewhere went supernova and threatened to destroy the galaxy. A star will explode and threaten to destroy the galaxy. Huh? The whole galaxy? That must have been a big supernova. Aren't there like billions of stars in our own galaxy and this kind of thing happens all the time? Ah, whatever. You see, they once tried to base Star Trek in actual science. The technical advisors on Star Trek The Next Generation constantly check the latest data compiled by NASA and other science institutions to ensure the technical accuracy of the series. Uh, nah, fuck that now. <sighs> Look, I have to stop here. It's a good time to point out something really important. What's important is that these kind of scientific things no longer really matter in the new Star Trek. And me discussing them is utterly pointless. When reviewing the Star Wars prequels, I was reviewing them on the fact that they failed as films first. Films that didn't quite connect with the audience. The technical details of Star Wars and how that universe works doesn't really matter because it's science fantasy not science fiction. Star Trek was always based more on real scientific stuff rather than pure fantasy. I'll give you an example. In Star Trek, a great deal of time was devoted to the warp engines and how they worked. Matter, antimatter, reaction, the function of dilithium crystals, how and why a warp field was created, and so on. Countless episodes deal with this subject matter, and a ton of stories in Star Trek are centered all around these ideas and concepts. In Star Wars, spaceship engines served one purpose. They get characters from here to there. We're never told how they work, how hyperspace works, what fuels the engines, etc. Luke just flies from Hoth to Dagobah and X-Wing. No biggie. Whatever. None of it really mattered. What mattered in Star Wars is the story, the adventures, and the emotions. It's a pretty clear-cut example of the difference between the two. Science fiction and science fantasy. Not to say that Star Trek didn't also deal in characters, adventure, and emotion, but the series was more heavily based in the technical nuances of how things work. Matter, antimatter, mixture ratio settings, and optimum balance, reaction sequence, Corresponding to specified norms, magnetic plasma transfer to warp field generators, or programmed specs. Punch it. It's what separated Star Trek from Star Wars, and what gave Star Trek the more nerdy stigma. With the new Star Trek movie, there was a notable attempt to make the film more like Star Wars, and that really comes through. Let's punch it. So the truth is, you have to learn to set aside the Star Trek mindset and look at this new movie from a whole different perspective. When you do that, you could kind of enjoy it. It's like looking at one of those magic eye things. My wife once sent me a message from beyond the grave in one of those magic eye things when I was looking at one in the bookstore. It said, I will not rest until I see you prosecuted for my murder. Anyway, the movie does vaguely reference some of the old Star Trek concepts and ideas, but it's all just in some kind of non-technical fantasy way. You see, in my opinion, where the prequels utterly failed, 
Star Trek excelled. Star Trek is really engaging. It's fun, adventurous, fast paced. Heroes are heroes and villains are villains. And at the very least, you know what's happening. It's everything we did not get in the prequels. At no point were we completely bored and confused. Sorry, I can't find your signal. You're moving too fast. I can do that. I can do that. Take the gun. I sir. The black hole's expanding. We won't reach minimum safe distance if we don't leave immediately. Hold on, hold on. Compensating gravitational pull. Your Highness, with your permission, we're heading for a remote planet called Tatooine. It's in a system far beyond the reach of the trap. In fact, J.J. Abrams should have directed the prequels, and George Lucas should have directed people to their seats in the theater. But anyway, back to bitching about the technical details in the new Star Trek movie. So Spock is sent to stop the supernova from destroying Romulus by using something called red matter to create a black hole to suck up the supernova before it destroys the planet. Wow. And you thought your job at PetSmart was hard. Anyway, Spock is late, he fucks it up, and then still sucks up the supernova anyway. Hey wait, if all Spock needed was a tiny blob of red matter to make a black hole, and there was only like... one supernova? Then why did he bring so much red matter? Also, such material would probably be really valuable to space terrorists. So some security would have been good. A few more Vulcan ships, maybe. So was the lightning storm in space kind of near Romulus, or in the Federation's territory? I don't know what's happening. We've received a distress call from Vulcan. Okay, Vulcan sends out a distress signal, and Starfleet sends a bunch of ships there. What appeared to be a lightning storm in space. Soon after, Starfleet received a distress signal from the Vulcan High Command. Because Vulcan says they're having seismic activities that their planet was experiencing seismic activity. And they attribute this to the lightning storm in space. So wait, the lightning storm in space that's near the Klingon neutral zone is causing seismic activity all the way on Vulcan? Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And not anywhere else, or is it worse, closer to it? Unless Nero sent a phony distress signal as a trap, like Kirk said. We're warping into a trap, sir. The right, I already said that. But if Nero's goal was to blow up all the Federation planets... That is why I will destroy all the remaining Federation planets, starting with yours. Then why would he want a bunch of ships attacking him when he was trying to do it? I need the subspace frequencies of Starfleet's border protection grids. Oh. Well, maybe he wanted them there so he could get the border protection codes from one of the captains. You know, so he could attack Earth next? But if that were the case, then why did he destroy the whole fleet? Sir, there's another Federation ship! Destroy it, too! He was even gonna destroy the Enterprise, too, until he saw that it was the ship the Spock was on. Wait a minute, what the heck planet is he on where he can see Vulcan in the sky that big? Is it a Vulcan moon? Vulcan has no moon. Oh, I guess not. But if these planets are that close to each other, then why is the one planet a frozen wasteland while Vulcan is a hot desert planet? They just like made this planet up because they needed it for the story, right? Ah, Star Wars mindset. Keep focused. Stay in the Star Wars mindset. Maybe I just need another vodka gimlet. Oh. Now Spock just says that a star went supernova, right? 129 years from now, a star will explode. I assume it wasn't the Romulan sun, because it would have blowed up Romulus in like one millisecond. If it was a distant star, then it probably would have taken the supernova like years to reach Romulus. Do they know how much distance is in between stars? I don't know where things are happening. Also, young Spock hypothesizes that a black hole could be used to create a time travel portal, right? Such technology could theoretically be manipulated to create a tunnel through space-time. So I'd assume that old Spock knew this too. It was his red matter. 
So how did the Vulcans know for sure that the black hole would just absorb the supernova and not send it through time? Did they test this out on a different supernova? Or was it all theoretical? It's a pretty big risk to take, assholes. Maybe Romulus was meant to be destroyed by the natural course of events of this galaxy. Remember when Data wanted to save that little girl? When Picard said leave, let her whole family die? When their whole planet started erupting in volcanoes because it wasn't his job to interfere with the natural course of events of their planet? There are no options. The Prime Directive is not a matter of degrees. It is an absolute. So we make an exception in the deaths of millions. See, the Prime Directive has many different functions, not the least of which is to protect us. To prevent us from allowing our emotions to overwhelm our judgment. I promised the Romulans that I would save their planet. What we do today may profoundly affect the future. If we could see every possible outcome, we'd be gods, which we're not. If there is a cosmic plan, is it not the height of hubris to think that we can or should interfere? Using red matter, I would create a black hole, which would absorb the exploding star. Next, young Spock launches Kirk onto an ice planet, where he just happens to land right near a cave that old Spock just happens to be in. Then both of them just happen to be right near where Scotty's at, who just happens to be the guy that invented the idea of transwarp beaming and beaming within a solar system. Both concepts that they're gonna put to use in the next half hour. Too many coincidences? Well, I have an explanation. It was the will of the Force that they all meet, so it makes perfect sense. Kirk and Spock are destined to be shipmates, as it was prophesied that this will bring balance to the Federation. Oh wait, I'm confusing this with Stargate. So the main bad guy Nero, who was named after the CD burning software, worked as some kind of miner on a big ass ship that must have mined the whole planets in the future or something. Nero uses his ship to drop the red matter he took from Spock from the future into Vulcan of the past so that he could suck up the planet because he's pissed at Spock. I guess the red matter needs like a ton of heat or energy to turn into a black hole, or else dropping it into the planet's core is sort of pointless. Oh wait, I guess it doesn't. I don't know what's happening. Anyway, whatever. So Nero's motivated by revenge, of course, because Spock didn't save his planet and his wife died. And she looks nothing like a Romulan woman, by the way. Romulan women are ugly-ass broads kind just see a biker bars. Anyway, so if you look at it logically, Nero's motivation is weird and makes no sense. Having your wife on a planet that gets obliterated and then sucked up into a black hole? Well, that gets rid of something they like to call evidence. Ah, I'd love to see Detective Gary Podluski from the Teaneck Police Department retrieve evidence from a black hole. Good luck with that, Gary. Yeah, I'll see you in court, asshole. Anyway, all Spock did was try to help. And unless Nero had some kind of proof that Spock intentionally failed because he hated Romulans, then Nero was mad at Spock for no real reason. In fact, in this timeline, Spock was the guy who was all about reunification with the Romulans, so I'm sure he gave it his best shot. Second, they mentioned that it was the Vulcan Science Academy that initiated the mission. Commissioned by the Vulcan Science Academy. But just like Star Trek Nemesis, the villain now wants to go after Earth, too. He's going after Earth. For no reason other than the audience is from Earth. And then we might care. Now if you assume that Nero just snapped, and then went totally and completely insane after his wife died, then it all makes perfect sense. Crazy people don't have to make sense. Jim, madness has no purpose. Or reason. But it may have a goal. The problem is, is that Nero has a crew of like 12 or so other Romulans, too. All of them can't be just as crazy and driven by convoluted logic, too. In many situations like this, when a crazy leader goes really off the deep end, someone else will get a bit nervous, as if their plans just might be going a bit too far. Moving them is one thing, killing them all. No one hated them more than you, Gona. The other Romulans appear to have no problems with killing six billion people. 
Without having that scene where Nero's second in command asks if what he's doing is a good idea, they've reduced Romulans to totally mindless monsters. When before they really weren't. I don't know, maybe the black hole scrambled their brains. I know a black hole once tried to scramble my brains, but don't worry, everything turned out well. But you say Romulans were always villains. Well, that's right, but only in the sense that they had like a secretive society. Not all Romulans were bad people. They were as diverse as any other race. And while Romulans would kill and torture to protect their empire, I doubt most would condone genocide on such a grand scale. He's not planning to defeat Earth. He's planning its annihilation. And his sins will mark us and our children for generations. So anyway, we get to the end of the film, and their plan is for the Enterprise to disguise itself in the rings of Saturn, and then Kirk and Spock are gonna beam onto Shinzon's ship from there. So Kirk rescues Pike, the Enterprise saves Spock from missiles, and he crashes the ship into Nero. Spock! So yeah, this ending is pretty much a shoot em up, fight with the bad guy, lots of choking, big explosion ending. But the point of all this is so that Kirk and Spock can finally work together as a team, thus establishing their professional relationship, and the beginning of a friendship. This is why this all works for me, because if this climax was too complex or cerebral, it would overshadow the simple fact that this is a character-driven origin story. That and the fact that this whole ending sequence is pretty slick and very well done. It's not as awkward and pathetic as the action in the Next Generation films. Again, I'll recall my gradient spectral graphic. And as some weird guy said, you got classical music and you got rock and roll. Both are good in their own context. But when you get somewhere in the middle, you end up with child banging on a piano. Number 8. References